Hello and welcome to this uh, video on sport in Africa. In this video, we're going to be looking at what sport in Africa looks like and how modern sport in Africa has been shaped to date. We're going to look at how sport has played a role in notions of nation building within the continent. We're going to take a look at a couple of case studies in which sport in Africa and particularly South Africa has interacted with politics and wider social cultural trends throughout history. And we're finally going to look at what are some of the challenges that sport in Africa face. I think it's probably just quite pertinent and relevant to highlight that actually trying to do a, a, a video or a podcast about the content in Africa uh, the content of Africa within sort of 45 to 50 minutes is is very difficult um, as as it is with every continent. And one of the issues in doing that is that stereotypes are, are all too common, really. And when it comes to the continent and people of Africa, and actually it's a huge, huge continent. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions that surround Africa, but the continent is far more than just the sum of its stereotypes. And, and actually one of the most common uh, misnomers or, or um, stereotypes is that Africa is a country as opposed to a con uh, continent, but actually it's not. It's a continent of 54 different countries and 11 territories that are home to an estimated 3,000 distinct ethnic groups who speak over 2,000 different languages. So hugely diverse continent uh, and, and, and so many countries in, involved. Um, Nigeria and Cameroon are home to an unfavorable amount of uh, languages alone, with more than 500 spoken in the former and 200 in the latter. In Nigeria, English is the official language, although uh, they've got a number of other uh, sort of more um, uh, local dialects which are far more common as first languages. French, English and German have all been official languages in Cameroon, but if you visit the country, you might be just as likely to hear um, Fran Inglis or some of the other um, local dialects that are spoken. In terms of religions, um, Islam, Islam sorry, is the most dominant religion in, in Africa. Um, Christianity is second. By 2050, the year 2050, some project that nearly 40% of all Christians will live in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, it's arguably the most diverse continent in the world. This diversity stems from the fact that Africa is a really big country, just in land mass alone, and is about as big as the combined land masses of China, the United States, India, Japan, and much of Europe. Its 11.7 million square miles of land is rich in di biodiversity, featuring forest, woodland, savanna, grassland, desert, wetland, and marine ecosystems. So incredibly diverse um, number of countries, languages, religion, but also just its landmass as well. So really, if we would summarise, the truth is that Africa's 54 countries defy generalisation. Thus, when reference is made to Africa, including within what we will discuss within this video and, and podcast, please take it with an analytical angle and consider whether statements are true for the whole continent. Furthermore, to try and even capture an ounce of the diversity of African sport within one hour is going to be far too hard. Therefore, after providing some background to the sport on the continent, we're going to just look at a couple of case studies and, and predominantly within South Africa as opposed to um, the rest of the continent. And I suppose what I would encourage here is to, to look into sport in other countries as well and consider how sport changes in other countries across the continent. So there is a number of traditional sports that are played in Africa. Um, and they've of course got their own sports and these act activities um, were little esteemed by the kind of imperial masters which is something we'll come on to talking about but sports such as wrestling martial arts foot races canoe racing and competitive dancing offer compelling evidence of how african societies embrace sports geese which is the the kind of the spirit of sport um and as the historians William Baker and Tom Mangan explain, throughout pre-colonial Africa, dances and games were long before, performed sorry, with a serious akin to sports in modern industrial societies, and for purposes not altogether different. The striving for status, the aspiration of identity, the maintenance and power in one form or another, and the indoctrination of youth into the culture of their elders. Indigenous sports were spectacle of fitness and physical prowess, technical and tactical expertise. So although the sports themselves 
that were kind of played and performed in Africa were very different from the kind of form, uh, sports that we're familiar with, uh, perhaps in, in Europe. Um, the kind of the elements or the spirits of them were very akin to one another. We've got a couple of different examples here. So we've got uh, Ngani, which is a kind of a form of stick fighting, a martial art form, um, very popular in South Africa and strongly rooted in their history. It's a <clears throat> stick fight that can last up to five hours where opponents take turns at playing offensive and defense scoring points based on which parts of the body is struck. Um, we've got uh, Dambi boxing. Um, this is an ancient form of boxing with ties to northern Nigeria. Participants travel to different villages at harvest time and challenge those of the butcher class to duel as festival entertainment. The dominant arm of both fighters are tied together with rope and they try to strike themselves with punches and kicks until one person drops to the floor. Um, we've got uh, Senegalese wrestling here, which is uh, popularly called Lamb in uh, Senegal. This sport is over 100 years old and began as a recreational sport for farmers and fishermen. Currently, elite fighters can command up to $100,000 per match and is a giant rival of uh, football in the country of Senegal. And we've got Tekert Om M M Ban, which is a, a kind of form of baseball, essentially. It sort of kind of strikes uh, a lot of resemblance to, to baseball. Um, and it's played uh, in, in Libya. Uh, it popularly believed that the sport was exported to Europe during the Stone Age and renamed as baseball thereafter. So clearly pre-colonial athletic traditions had much in common Western sport and as such they provided the soil into which the seeds of European sport would later be planted. So um, we'll talk about the kind of um, movement of Europeans to Africa um, in the kind of 19th century. But up until this point, Africans are competing. These sports are deemed to, to be uh, have little esteem by the kind of uh, Europeans that are coming to the continent. Um, but actually, once the Europeans arrive in the continent, um, modern sports start with this kind of European imperial expansion in the last two centuries. And the agents of that imperialism played sports among themselves, but also saw sport as a tool for civil civilization. So um, the British and, and the French and the German as we'll look at that were all moving to Africa, um, that were all playing the sports, but they all, all wanted to try a new sport as a way to um, uh, bring the, the, the African people together. For example, British soldiers, sailors, traders and government employees enjoyed football for their own entertainment, but they also saw it as pivotal in the European civilising mission in Africa. Building on their experiences with youth and urban workers in industrial Britain, teachers and missionaries used these inexpensive and easy to learn fun to satisfy the white man's burden. And this expression, the white man's burden, is taken from Rudyard Kipling's famous formulation, meant teaching African converts and colonial subjects about the virtues of Christianity, capitalist commerce and Western civilization. So sport provided quite an easy means of interacting and trying to promote or um, we could probably even um, say indoctrinate to some extent um, African people into this westernized way of thinking, um, which of course today we would, we would look at very, very differently in terms of that kind of level of appropriateness. Um, but yes, this is kind of quite an easy way to engage with people, obviously, because language barriers um, can be overcome through the through, through sport. So I mentioned this um, movement of Europeans. So we've got this kind of scramble for Africa um, in 1884 and 1885. Um, and this is predominantly where the country is carved up um, by European countries. Um, so we've got the latter third of the 1800s. European imperial powers such as the British Empire expanded from their small coastal colonies to seize control of most of the continent of Africa which has since been called the Scramble for Africa. In part, the scramble was facilitated by the 1884 Berlin Conference, in which European imperial powers agreed on a system to recognise each other's control of colonies and in accordance with international law. And perhaps important to note that at this meeting in Berlin, there weren't any Africans present and they weren't invited to attend it. So the kind of the future of the country was decided without um, indigenous people being present. This led to a situation in which the majority of the continent were ruled and run by colonial powers, such as the British Empire. Um, Great Britain, for example, got southern and north eastern Africa from Berlin, 
um, and that meeting. So from 1880 to 1900, Britain gained control over or occupied what is now known as Egypt, Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Northwestern Somalia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, Nigeria, Ghana and Mali. And if you look at this map, you can see in red the countries that were at one point owned by the British Empire. Um, so they had control of these countries or these countries formed part of the British Empire for quite a significant period of time until particularly the kind of between the 1930s and the 1960s sort of um, African nationalist political parties and their respective nations gained independence from their colonial masters. So particularly after the Second World War, there was this kind of um, movement of countries gaining back independence from from the kind of colonial masters. We've got nationalist parties who had provided independence, then divided into factions, and native leaders struggled for power and profits formerly enjoyed by their colonial masters. So this kind of um, nationalist party coming into control of these countries, but perhaps not able to, to leverage the same level of power and resources that the colonial countries were able to. We had various ethnic, religious, economic and ideological interests really coming to the floor during this period of time. And whether independence was won from Britain, France, uh, the Netherlands or Portuguese rule, however it came to force, whether that was through force or through negotiation, and whether it was infused with capitalist or socialist ideologies, new African nations all, fans, all kind of faced this struggle for stability. And beyond these structures of stability lay a more difficult task of trying to build a sense of nationhood and overcome tribal loyalties and interests and sent sentiments of respect for and allegiance to the new nation state. So previous to the formation of these countries, which were then carved up, there hadn't really been notions of countries as such or nations, but more tribes and, and, and indigenous tribes. So in Zambia, for example, there's 47 different dialects that are spoken, which are all based on different tribes within that country. So then to try together to come together as one nation, quite a, a bit of a challenge for some of these countries that are kind of now embracing this notion of being a country and being a nation. And, I, and essentially what these kind of political governments did in trying to create this sense of nationhood is they adopted the traditions of flags and anthems however great the instrument of integration was, um, uh, the integration of the national political hero. So whether that would be uh, Kenneth Kwanda in, in, in Zambia, for example, the person who gained independence on behalf of that country, who had been in charge at the time of that country, gaining independence from these kind of colonial masters. And they were kind of elevated as the incarnation of this new country's values and aspirations. So you're probably wondering at this point what this has to do with uh, sport and how sport fits in at this point. Um, but if political heroes came first in this sort of sense of creating values and um, creating the sense of a nation, then uh, athletic heroes shortly followed afterwards. So as African runners especially emerged to the forefront of the international arena in the 1960s, they proudly displayed their new nation colours. Returning home, they received accolades which had previously been reserved for the heads of new African states. And by 1970, African athletes had become powerful symbols of national identity. Likes of heads, they had the advantage though, because uh, like heads of states, they were highly visible, but they had a second advantage, is which, which is that their kind of apolitical fame could not be toppled by a coup. You know, they couldn't become unpopular in a political sense, and they didn't have this kind of tightrope tight right that they were walking in that kind of popularity sense. Um, and in the world at large, they served as unofficial ambassadors for developing African nations desperately in need of foreign technological expertise and capital investments. Um, athletes that have been successful on the international stage, say at the British Commonwealth Games or at the Olympic Games, meant international visibility and prestige. Indeed, Tanzania's director of sport referred to the runner Philbert Baye Sanko as a roving ambassador showing the strength and determination of our people. As we can see, uh, 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 Phil Bear Bay on the screen, he was a Tanzanian former middle distance runner who competed throughout the 1970s. He set the world records for the 1500 metres in 1974 and the mile in 1975. His world record in the 1500 metres was also the Commonwealth Games record until as recently as 2022. So what cultural ambassadors in African representatives to, to the United, United Nations attempted, athletes achieved with apparent ease, publicizing an image of strength and success rather than poverty and instability. So sport was this vehicle, this mechanism to promote nations to the world. 
Um, and it was quite a, a, a kind of um, highly publicized, mediated form of, of putting a country on the map, essentially. Um, so we've got this uh, American runner, Marty Lequia's exaggeration uh, makes the point no one had heard of Kenya until Kip Kino won in Mexico City. Um, John Aki Buo's victory in Munich drew attention to Uganda before Idi Amin. So this kind of sense that countries are becoming familiarized or recognized because of their uh, athletes is quite important in terms of putting them on a map and, and kind of promoting them to the rest of the world. Um, indeed, much of the history of black African participation in the modern international arena of sport has to do with concerted efforts to isolate and ultimately to destroy the final bastions of European colonialism on the continent. And sport is a leverage for the moving of political mountains. Is It is, in George Orwell's well-worn well phrase, war minus the shooting. And Africa's participation in the Olympic Games really reflected the political history of Africa. The first continent, the, sorry, the continent's first Olympic victor was a South African schoolboy named R.E. Walker, who was a member of an all-white sports club modelled on traditional European lines. Walker won the gold medal in the 100 metres at the Olympics in uh, the London Olympics in 1908. At Stockholm four years later, Ali Mohammed Hussein of Egypt competed in the sabre and foil events, but it was another 16 years before two Egyptian athletes became Olympic medalists. Only South Africa and Egypt regularly represented the entire African continent in the Olympic Games until small teams from Nigeria and Ghana competed in the Helsinki Games of 1954. Prior to 1960, in fact, nearly 15 South Africans, six, uh, six Egyptians and a handful of North Africans had won Olympic laurels. So very um, um, minimal activity in terms of collecting medals up until really the 1960s when um, black Africans in particular had really struggled to, to, to win um, accolades. However, finally in 1960, Abebe Bikila of Ethiopia ran the marathon barefoot through the streets of uh, Rome to claim the first gold medal for a black African nation. Um, coming in second was Ben Radi of uh, Morocco, as four of the, their first eight places in the marathon went to Africans. In all, about 100 Africans participated in the Rome Olympics, um, and uh, in Tokyo four years later, 150 Africans competed. So this kind of huge surge, particularly in the 60s, of African participation and representation at the Olympic Games. And this surge uh, to Olympic visibility came squarely in the midst of the movement for African independence from European rule. Whereas only five autonomous African nations, uh, African states existed prior to 1960, no fewer than 16 nations claimed to independence the same year that Bikili first won an Olympic medal. And thus, the year 1960, or the Olympics, was actually dubbed the Year of Africa. Within the following decade, the total number of independent states had climbed to 43, representing some 300 million Africans living under governments of their own people. Again, dramatic athletic victories at the Mexico Games of 1968 symbolized the African emergence. In the thin air of Mexico City, 13 African athletes took the victory stand to receive 16 different medals compared to only three medals at each of the two previous Olympics. Um, and as some social scientists have explained it, sport at the international level provided instant recognition for new African nations. Australian runner Ron Clark offers a much simpler, much more vivid explanation, which is as well as their physical attributes, the Africans have a tremendous incentive of representing small, intensely proud emerging nation, uh, nations. Rightly, they are regarded as national heroes whose exploits win their country more publicity and prestige than dozens of rousing political speeches. Yet the international political meaning of sport for emerging African nations ultimately depends on the internal social meaning of sport for modern Africans. No simple explanation will suffice, nor can attention of a single sport such as track adequately explain the significance of sport for Africans in the international arena. And so we sort of now turn to uh, kind of a less savory aspect of sport and politics in Africa, which ultimately um, had an African, uh, sorry, uh, a kind of a more positive ending. So we're going to look here at um, apartheid in South Africa, um, 
and uh, most people will know the basis of the apartheid system which existed in South Africa uh, from 1948 to 1994, that being that white people were classed as um, first class citizens uh, and white people were, were not ultimately. Um, and that there was this kind of racial segregation of non-whites in South Africa. So we had um, the non-white racial classifications of African, colored or Indian, as they were laid out in legislation, meant that those people had limited opportunities in all areas, including, but not limited to, housing, employment, education, the use of public facilities, and of course, sport, even though they made up around 85% of the people. Um, in terms of sport, there were black leagues in all of the sports, but these were underfunded, and not really a place where a talented person could actually earn a living. Um, and all of the South African teams were exclusively white, even though, as mentioned, white people only made up roughly 15% of the South African population at the time. Um, not only this, the South African government wouldn't even allow mixly, uh, racially mixed teams to compete against South African national sides. And it was this kind of backwardness that ultimately led to the sporting boycott, which started technically with South Africa's exclusion from the Olympics in 1964, but would really come to a head with the exposure thrown on the apartheid regime by the international domestic controversies surrounding the canceled cricket tours of 1968 and 1970. You can see here some statistics on um, apartheid and the populations of South Africa uh, and those that were obviously able to benefit um, from um, facilities and housing uh, and those who were not. So sport is probably a good opportunity to explore apartheid and what we have uh, on who we have on the screen sorry is Bal uh, Basil Delivier. Um, Basil Delivier was a, a kind of a, was a South African born cricketer whose parents were of Indian and Portuguese descent, which meant that when the apartheid system was officially adopted in South Africa in 1948, when Dolivera was just 16 years old, he was classified as coloured and thus non-white and thus classified as a second, second class citizen who was deprived of various human rights, including representing his nation on a sports field. Therefore, he moved to the UK to play cricket professionally, as he wasn't going to be able to play cricket professionally in South Africa. And after a string of impressive performances and accolades, Dolivera rose through the ranks, gained British citizenship and started playing test cricket on behalf of England. Now, this had a, um, a kind of uh, this caused a lot of worry amongst the South African government, because since Dolivera had been selected for the England team in 1966, there had been communications between the South African and the English cricketing authorities about Dolivera's potential inclusion in the scheduled 1968 and 1967 tour of South Africa by the English cricket team. Although these talks were never made public because of the South African government's concerns over its international reputation. So South Africa even went so far as to instruct agents of the South African government to attempt to bribe Dolivera into making himself unavailable for the tour. Most notably, even as late as the summer of 1968 itself, only months before the tour was due to take place, the South African government used a guy called Tini Bohausen, who was the director of a tobacco company, to offer Dolivera a job coaching amateur cricket in South Africa at a salary of £4,000, which was a much higher wage than Basil Dolivera could possibly have earned as a professional cricketer at that time. But this job offer came with the catch that Dolivera must make himself unavailable for selection for the tour in 1968. However, Dolivera rejected all the bribes and inducements offered to him and carried on just playing cricket, which was all he ever really wanted to do in the first place. But there were several twists in the tale yet to come. Um, the selection for the final squad to the tour of South Africa took place on the 27th of August 1968 uh, at a meeting of the Marylebone Cricket Club, who were, kind of, were at the time almost the governing body. Um, the meeting took place just five days after Basil Dolivera had scored an incredible 158 runs in the final Ashes Test of the summer. And there was, there was kind of a, a view that it was almost going to be impossible for the, the cricketing board not to select um, uh, Basil Dolivera, if merit and merit alone were the only criteria being used, but uh, unfortunately this wasn't the only consideration of the selection panel. And the selection, uh, selection committee uh, assembled amid great public and public, uh, sorry, and political scrutiny and uh, pressure, notably pressure from the English cricketing public for Dolivera to be selected on merit, and from the opposite direction pressure came from the South African government, 
who had sent a clandestine letter to members of the committee outlining that if Dolavira were selected, it may very well cause the cancellation of his tour altogether, along with enormous financial loss that this would cause to the English cricketing board's um, finances. Um, ultimately, the committee took the decision not to select Dolavira for the tour, and to add insult to injury, they didn't bother to inform him personally. He would later hear the news on radio after coming off the field playing for Worcestershire, where he'd scored a century, this time against Sussex, um, which again kind of highlighted what kind of a rich vein of form he was in at the time. And the response to his selection, uh, or non-selection, sorry, was was fairly overwhelming. So many members of the, the cricketing council, the, the selection panel, resigned in protest at the decision. And former England captain um, David Shepherd, along with 70 other MCC members, called for the tour to be cancelled. There was a letter-writing campaign to British Prime Minister Harold Wilson, asking him to personally intervene in the matter. And the British anti-apartheid apartheid movement began to, ser to gain serious momentum in the wake of uh, Dolavira's exclusion. In South Africa, the, the news that he hadn't been selected was greeted as a betrayal by the non-white population and as by relief by the white nationalists and the apartheid regime, although this joy by the whites would be tempered soon after with the news that Dolavera had agreed to cover the series as a journalist for the British newspaper, The News of the World. This outraged the South African government as non-whites were not allowed in press boxes, except in menial capacities and threatened to ban Dolavera from even being allowed on the tour as a journalist. However, that particular threat would pale into significance with what came next because one of the England team that had been selected for that was fast bowler Tom Cartwright, who'd been struggling with an injury and decided to withdraw from the squad. Um, it's probably worth highlighting that there is a kind of uh, theory that maybe he wasn't injured, but he had some moral reservations about touring in apartheid South Africa, and but didn't want to kind of publicly embarrass the MCC, so fabricated the story of an injury to allow a plausible way out of the tour party. But whatever the kind of the case was for Cartwright's withdrawal from the squad, there was nowhere else for the MCC to go but to select Dolavira for the tour. And in an extraordinary meeting, the committee took just 10 minutes to decide to add to add Basil Dolavira to the squad. In Britain, the news was received positively by most people, although some had reservations about the uh, diplomatic impl implications of the decision. Um, in South Africa, the Prime Minister, um, Richard Foster, was outraged, slamming the decision as politically motivated, stating at an or Orange Free State Congress rally in Bloemfontein, on September the 17th, we are and always have been prepared to play host to the MCC. We are not prepared to the senior team first, uh, the passport, uh, whose interests are not the game, but to certain political objectives, which they do not even attempt to hide. This is not a team of the MCC, but the team of an anti-apartheid movement. Um, I think what's kind of interesting here is that he claimed that the decision to include Basil Dolavira was a politically motivated one, um, which kind of implies that he doesn't see how the 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 the, the choice not to select non-whites uh, is not a political commentary in some way. So kind of an interesting uh, way of looking at that. Um, the notion that that you know that, that only having whites only sporting representation was in some way not a glaring political statement, and also that having strict racial segregation was somehow good for the sport, um, just simply on the terms of even ignoring eighty five percent of the population that could be eligible to play. And this kind of whole affair led to a frenzied diplomatic effort being made to save the tour, with MCC member Colin Cowdery flying to South Africa for talks and later representatives of the South African Cricket Association flying to London with the, to meet with the MCC. No common ground could be reached. The South African government would not entertain the notion of allowing a non-white player to face their all-white team, and the MCC could be seen to, uh, cannot be seen to back down due to the increasingly unpopular racist apartheid system. And although it was very much Foster, Richard Foster, the prime minister in the South African government who cancelled uh, 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 cancelled it all, and it was the MCC who announced it to the world following an extraordinary four hour meeting at the full committee at Lord's Cricket Club in September, they released a statement stating that oh, the, they had decided unanimously that the tour wouldn't take place. Um, so following the events of 1968 and this kind of boycott, essentially, of, of the South African tour, the British government intervened to cancel the proposed tour of the South African team to England scheduled for 1970. So they were due to return two years later. Spearheaded 
By pressure from the then Home Secretary and future Prime Minister James Callaghan, the British government took the unprecedented step of sending a formal request from Her Majesty's government to withdraw the invitation of a South African touring team. And this amounted to a demand that the MCC could hardly refuse to enforce. Clearly, the sporting boycott actions of the Dolivero affair were starting to take hold. And so the UK government banned South Africa until such times as it would completely drop its policy of strict racial segregation. Indeed, no South African cricket team would play in England again until 1994. A Western nation had finally opposed the apartheid regime, and this paved the way forward for other powerful nations to follow suit. Anti-apartheid movements flourished all over the world in the wake of the Dolivera affair. And the decision of the British government to cancel the South African tour of England in 1978 was itself a precursor to the decision made by the International Cricket Council to ban apartheid South Africa from cricket completely in 1971. And this is where it really began to snowball for, for South Africa and the apartheid government. The ban from cricket was followed swiftly by sport after sport, prohibiting the nation from competition until it ended its policy of strict racial segregation, most notably the International Olympic Committee, which had actually banned South Africa four years prior in 1964 in the wake of the conviction and imprisonment of Nelson Mandela. But the IOC in 1968 was preparing to reinstate South Africa. But the events that uh, sort of forced, uh, that had taken place with cricket kind of forced their hand into permanently suspending this apartheid state from the summer and winter Olympics. The ban passed, the Olympic Committee in South Africa would not compete at IOC events again until the Summer Games of 1992 in Barcelona. Um, the sporting boycott of South Africa continued to grow from there as they were banned from the International Athletics Federation in 1970. And in the same year, the South African team were ejected from the tennis premier international competition, the Davis Cup. And although they were readmitted to, uh, readmitted to the 1977 and 78 editions of the tournament, those were also heavily boycotted by other nations. And then the tennis authorities banned South Africa completely in 1979. Furthermore, uh, South Africa was shut out from the first two editions of the Rugby World Cup and were suspended by FIFA. Um, so they were essentially cut off from the entire sporting world. And that kind of really hurt a nation that um, fundamentally loved their sport. And this kind of sets a bit of a backdrop for the, the second case study that I want to use, which is um, around the 1995 Rugby World Cup. Um, and if we think really that this apartheid and the kind of the gross human rights violations had made South Africa a bit of an international pariah. They were really um, uh, cast out of, of, the, of the sporting um, community um, and they were, weren't allowed to compete in the first two Rugby World Cups in, in 1987 and 1991. Um, and because of this kind of strict policy of only playing white players, to black South Africans, the historically white team, along with their green and gold colours and their springbok mascot, had come to symbolize the nation's oppressive minority white rule. However, following his um, release from, from jail for 27 years for challenging the white minority-led apartheid system, Nelson Mandela saw rugby as really being a way to help lessen divides between black and white South Africans and foster a shared national pride. Um, and the African, uh, Africana uh, National Party had deep ties to the rugby team, which had fielded an all-white roster for its first 90 years. The party embraced the team's success as its own, and players sometimes used the team as a springboard into political in party uh, positions, political party positions. When um, Nelson Mandela came to uh, power, many black South Africans wanted to destroy any symbols of the apartheid regime. High on the list of, of, of uh, those symbols was the Springbok, which had been the, the, the rugby team's mascot and the sports emblem of apartheid's uh, national party since 1906. After the first free elections in 1994, all South African national teams had adopted a protea, the country's national flower as their emblem, except for the rugby team. Um, and in a country where rugby was the kind of great national pastime, the Springbok emblem with its green and gold colours wasn't something many South Africans white South Africans, sorry, were willing to give up. Understanding this resistance to change, Nelson Mandela sought a considerary strategy that would allow Africans to keep their treasured emblem as a means to an end, bringing the nation together. 
At the beginning of his first term, he invited Francois Pina, the team's captain, to meet with him to discuss how the Springbok could use could be used to sort of broker peace between the black and white populations of South Africa. Um, however, uh, Nelson Mandela's conciliary gestures to a strictly or harshly racist um, apartheid regime didn't sit well with many black South Africans who were still dealing with the regime's legacy of oppression and violence. <clears throat> and after his uh, 1994 election, Nelson Mandela came off under fire from militant black groups who believed his ruling party, the National Congress, uh, sorry, the African National Congress, was too conciliatory to the former apartheid regime. One of his most vocal critics was actually his estranged wife, Minnie Mandela, who believed he focused more on appeasing whites than ensuring rights for black South Africans. While Mandela and the ANC listened to these critics, they continued to focus on reassuring the white minority that it wanted to build a strong working relationship. His appeals to black South Africans were often framed through the lens of what their support could mean for his uh, large aims for the country. Um, and before the start of the 1995 um, World Cup against um, the World Cup final, sorry, against New Zealand, a mostly white audience of 63,000 people at Ellis Park sang along as the uh, Springbok led a new national anthem. It combined the words from um, the apartheid uh, era anthem, um, which had been subject to earlier protests, and an old African liberation hymn from the anti apartheid movement. When Mandela appeared in the stadium wearing the Springbok green, the mostly Africana crowd shouted Nelson, Nelson, Nelson. So it was quite a popular move uh, to to sort of um, to buy into to the, the um, what had been an all white rugby team. The game really showcased the, the World Cup final really showcased Nelson Mandela's work in the weeks leading up to the matches, setting the stage for a historic and largely symbolic show of national unity across the races for the whole world to see. In the match, the two teams finished 9-9 uh, um, with seven minutes left in extra time. The South African team won with a drop goal uh, to secure a 15-12 victory. So South Africa, uh, in their first um, uh, entry into the Rugby World Cup, were the, were, won their first effort. However, despite Mandela's efforts to many black South Africans, the Springbok continued to represent a brutal apartheid regime. The team had won just uh, sorry. The team had just one black player in the 1995 matches, and in uh, 2019, when it won the World Cup uh, against England in the final, uh, only had six black players uh, and had its first black captain. Still, Mandela's efforts to use rugby to bring together a new nation struggling to heal its own uh, its old wounds became one of his signal achievements as president of South Africa. And a sign of what would be uh, what could be done, sorry, through through the kind of the power of sport. In 2000, at the Laureus World Sports Awards, Mandela said sport has the power to change the world. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. Um, so kind of an interesting two two interesting case studies, both based in South Africa, um, both around the kind of power of sport and how sport was used as a political force in both in both uh, ways and how it interacts with kind of broader social cultural uh, politics as well. Um, and I want to finish the podcast really by thinking about what challenges sport faces in Africa. Um, in 1974, uh, the football of Pele had predicted an African team would win the World Cup by the year 2000. That was a, a pretty bold forecast, but hopes of a of a FIFA World Cup winner from Africa seem as unlikely as 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 ever, really. So, what are some of the challenges for sport on the continent? This is a, a list of um, uh, challenges highlighted by, by Katonge. Um, and I'm just going to focus on the two in bold here, which is around this uh, idea of a policy vacuum. We'll also touch upon transparency, but also poor governance and corruption. So in terms of a policy vacuum, some African countries have sports policies, but the majority are fragmented, uh, fragmented and uncoordinated. Moreover, the ministries in charge of sports are often sandwiched in other ministries. The ministries of, or departments in change of sports suffer from underfunding and are unable to support priority activities. 
let alone establish and enforce policies. For example, Steiner noted that the challenges of sports development in Ghana are the result of the fact that activities are limited since they are held but once a year. And if we just touch upon corruption here as well, um, a Cameroon goalkeeper, a Cameroonian goalkeeper, uh, Joseph Antoine Bell, once claimed that 90 out of $100 in football appears disappears into private pockets. Um, so a big issue around kind of corruption in terms of uh, players' fees and, and, and where money in football goes. Um, he was obviously talking about this in the context of Cameroon, um, but... Um, has there have been accusations of this beyond Cameroon within the continent. Um, Transparency International's Global Corruption and Sport report highlighted that Africa is vulnerable to serious reputational risks across all sports and is already compromised by corruption. The Global Corruption report provides a global overview of corruption across sport and outlines recommendations from leading experts in the field on what needs to be done. It comes at a time when some of the world's most popular sports, including football and athletics, are mired in corruption scandals. In Africa, the report highlights serious gaps in accountability, including undemocratic processes in regional elections um, within CAF, which is the kind of governing body for uh, the equivalent of UEFA um, in, in Africa. We've got abuse of elections to national football associations in Zimbabwe, mismanagement of player bonuses in Nigeria, Togo, Ghana, Cameroon, uh, alleged misallocation of funds in Zambia and Kenya, systematic doping in Kenya, um, match fixing allegations in all of Africa, including Nigeria, Zimbabwe and South Africa, and human trafficking in Cameroon as well. Um, and the lack of transparency in African football was also recently highlighted by Transp Transparency International's Football Governance League table, which shows that only one African country uh, football association, Egypt, made its financial records accessible online. So there's kind of a wide range of issues that, that Africa faces in terms of its development. Um, and there's some recommended reading on Canvas um, to kind of further the, the, uh, the, the understanding and knowledge. Really important to highlight that these aren't um, challenges unique to Africa, um, but just touching upon what some of the issues the continent faces going forward. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed this video.